Well, we spent the last two videos talking about what happened to the group of survivors we've come to know and love and the infected they had to battle day in and day out after the events of the Parish finale. Since the release of Left 4 Dead 2 in 2009, we have had three major official DLCs released by Valve, both for PC and Xbox 360. Always take that in consideration, it's not just on PC. Today, we want to discuss if Coldstream was canon to the Left 4 Dead storyline or not. To answer the question, we have to look at the history of all content Valve has released for Left 4 Dead as the established this universe. The passing brought us some insight on what occurred in the road trip from Liberty Mall to the highway just outside of Whispering Oaks. While a good piece of story, the passing itself felt more like fan service than a necessary plotline. But regardless, it did give us an update and even slight closure on the original group of survivors and showed us that Bill had passed on. The sacrifice doubled up on this story and gave us the perspective of the Left 4 Dead 1 survivors leading up to the events of the passing, but gave the players the freedom to choose who would sacrifice themselves during the finale. Originally, the development team wanted to leave who the player chose to sacrifice as an open-ended conclusion, but decided to canonically kill Bill off in the end. After the passing and the sacrifice, which included an import of No Mercy, we were given one more DLC campaign that Valve officially released called Coldstream. While this campaign rolled out alongside every other Left 4 Dead 1 campaign, this specific campaign was unique. Most important to note was that Coldstream was mainly developed by Matthew Lordelay, a freelance level designer who originally created a fan-favorite community community-made campaign called Evil Eyes and even worked on the level design of other games later down the road. He went on to work for Bethesda and Arcane Studios for the level design of Dishonored 1 and 2. He went on to Radiant Worlds to work on the game Sky Saga. And now he is working on a secret project for Ubisoft Montreal. Valve was impressed by his gameplay arenas and effects and watched him closely as he designed the Coldstream campaign. Announced back in February of 2011, Valve showed they were lending him their support and eventually released the campaign as a beta to work any glitches and technicalities. Now you may be wondering why I'm going so in depth about the history behind the development of this campaign when I usually try to give a realistic approach to each video instead of putting the game disc or game file itself under the microscope. Well as I continued to read an official blog post from the Left 4 Dead development team, I came across probably the most crucial statement in regards to Coldstream's bearing in the continuity of the series. To quote directly from the blog, the very first step in creating a new DLC is deciding on the large goals and constraints for the DLC. The sacrifice and the passing were story heavy so we want to see what the other end of the spectrum looks like. For this DLC, we start with wanting to experiment by releasing a map pack that wasn't about story. It would just be new campaigns for Left 4 Dead 2. So there you go. They basically put out the idea that there was no new audio or no new story. This was a first for the team to have a campaign released where dialogue and story weren't the prime focus of the campaign and instead emphasize on just playing through it. Hence why no new lines were recorded for Ellis, Nick, Coach, and Rochelle and old lines were recycled instead. To add to the significance of this creative choice, this is also the only campaign where the poster does not show any survivors and just the opening of the campaign itself. This could have been done intentionally to emphasize either that it's mostly about the campaign and not the survivors for once, or that maybe, maybe they were really never even there to begin with! Spooky! So in review of it from a development perspective, since it was basically made by a fan and was literally the only fan-made campaign with Valve's stamp of approval, Suicide Blitz 2 deserved it more. <coughs> Uh, we have to come to the conclusion that Coldstream is not canonical since Valve barely had a hand in it and was produced with the purpose to not follow a story. But with all works of fiction, we can create alternate timelines and separate universes to explain these fan-related occurrences. Kind of like with Dragon Ball GT. Step into the Grand Tour. Grand Tour, Grand Tour. Step into the Grand Tour. Dragon, Dragon Ball GT. Half of all DC comics no. and constant reboots of old movies. Coldstream can be considered an alternate universe with everything put into perspective. In this alternate timeline, the military helicopter that left New Orleans after the events of the parish would have either crashed in a dense forest-like area along the Gulf of Mexico, or in a similar light to what happened between Ditter and Blood Harvest, an unexplained chain of events led the survivors from being airborne to ending up in a forest. The survivors apparently tried to use a small raft to go downstream back to the ocean, since all rivers flowed to a coast of some kind, until they eventually descend a semi-steep waterfall 
breaking the raft and putting them back on their feet to travel. It is unknown where Coldstream occurred, but the survivors would have gone to a forest-like area within a somewhat reachable distance with a helicopter from New Orleans, near the coast of either Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, or even Alabama. After researching possible dense forests near the coast and of near proximity, I could only figure out two forests near the Gulf of Mexico that were big enough, and then I'll get into the ones near New Orleans. The DeSoto National Forest in Mississippi is one of the most possible because of its nearly immediate vicinity, the green foliage taking up 810 square miles and is nearest to the coast. Its main river, the Luxie River, is where they possibly start off at. The military outpost seen at the very end of the campaign could have been also located in the nearby towns of either Biloxi and St. Martin. But a forest of this magnitude and scope would be a far stretch of how far along they would have to end up in a helicopter, especially with how scarce fuel may be. If we were to even be more realistic of where Coldstream were to be located, we have to remember the amount of man-made structures dotted the landscape, most notably the giant bridge the survivors crossed midway through the campaign. The only nearby forest-like area for them to possibly have ended up is one of few places, the Bayou Sauvage National Wildlife Refuge directly near New Orleans. After that die, this is a possibility due to its swamp-like area, which was probably the setting for swamp fever more than anything else, or if the helicopter from the Paris crossed Lake Pont Chartrain, they could crash or land at either Fontaine Blue State Park, Big Branch Marsh National Wildlife Refuge, have to access this one too because of its more swampy-like demeanor, and Pearl River Wildlife Management Area. The latter of these areas would be the best fit considering there is a considerable amount of man-made structures around the Pearl River area, and the nearby town of Pearl River has bridges that somewhat fit the bill of the mid-campaign cross bridge as seen here. The survivors could have also been following the actual Pearl River that divides Louisiana and Mississippi to get to shore before stumbling upon on yet another helicopter to escape in. The two middle chapters show heavy signs of nearby civilization with roads highly congested with traffic indicating that maybe people were trying to leave the greater New Orleans metropolitan area. This also adds to the notion that Coldstream takes place in the nearby forest areas of New Orleans. So hopefully my crash course in geography didn't bore the hell out of you already and maybe gave some insight on where Coldstream is supposed to be located. So in this alternate expansion of their struggle, it's not implausible for them to stumble into a forest-like area in Coldstream stream after they took off in the helicopter. But like I said earlier, we have to look at this campaign as nothing more than a fan-made side story, a fan fiction, much like any other custom campaign. Even though it has Valve's official release on it, it does not necessarily mean the setting was a concrete part of the Left 4 Dead 2 storyline. Each chapter in Coldstream had something to pretty much force you to run through it at a faster than normal pace without giving up too much time to absorb the environment, very unlike the rest of the campaigns offered in both installments of the Left 4 Dead franchise. Yes, moments like the scissor lift to no mercy and sounding the alarm in the parish did force you to fight through a horde, but it didn't happen repeatedly. This does, however, stress how a real epidemic like this would be, showing how you would only gather short amount of time to take a breath. Coldstream does have some memorable moments like the car alarm falling from the bridge and the fuel taker blowing up on its own. This was a new mechanic that forced the survivors into a crescendo event rather than giving them the option of when to start it, as long as they got close enough, that is. Gameplay-wise, I'm getting this from the Left 4 Dead wiki, so to those that say I just used the wiki and I'm just copy and pasting and I'm plagiarizing, here's your proof or whatever. Coldstream is unique in that every chapter ends with a gauntlet crescendo event leading to the safe room. The finale Cutthroat Creek is also a hectic gauntlet event going through the entire chapter like the bridge from the parish. So basically it was just Valve testing to see how the actual fans responded to their own creations to better test how Valve themselves could make future maps and campaigns. And then never released anything new after that instead. <laughs> So Coldstream was a new take at trying to figure out what the fans wanted to see, making a more hectic campaign, and really, just like I said earlier, there's no new voice lines. It's just, if the, the survivors feel like they're robots throughout all of it, it just doesn't seem like they're a part of the campaign. So, in retrospect, I know I've said it numerous times, but it, I know it's not canonical in the fact that Valve put it out through a fan, but it also just doesn't feel like something the survivors are going through. It just, it's, it really does feel like a fan-made campaign where they're just going through the motions. So, as I said, it's not canonical, but 
but we can always take it as like an alternate universe take. Now, did I cover everything about Coldstream that you think I should have covered? Was that way too much information? Should I take a look at Last Stand, the Survival Left 4 Dead 1 only campaign, which was only for survival? There's the usual MO of liking, commenting, and subscribing with the addition of tapping that bell to make your voice heard on what comes next for Wild Sedge Gaming. But to keep up to date on the channel, make sure to follow me on Twitch, Discord, Facebook, and Twitter, and you can also donate to my Patreon to keep me motivated, and tune in Saturday nights, sometimes Friday nights, for our YouTube live streams, and you can be a donator on that. Which, shoutouts to my Patreon and YouTube Super Chat donators. Lovable Tester, Mario, NATO6141, Ricardo Ascension, Dr. Doom PhD, Austin James Langford, Biscuits and Gravy, Prank Films, Alejandro Castellanos, Hey Lucky, Super Xbox David, Raging Means, Mr. Seven Plays, PhD Gamer R, Aftermath Games, Drake and Z4, Zeno Salvador, Scout with a Name, Twilight Duck, Nick B, Benny Boy, Kylie Elizabeth, Emerald Wolf, Florian B. Bell, Gaius Maiden, Jesse Piazza, Seductive Spy, Ninja Brian X, Ultra Instinct Adam, Carlisha Owens, The Gaming Hoovy, That Emo Guy, Taylor07, Juan Rodriguez, Retro Gamer, Josh McGugan, Michael Anthony, and Nico War. Thank you for your donations! Thank you.